In this world, there is real evil. In the darkest shadows and in the most ordinary places. These are the true stories of the innocent and the unimaginable. For Romeo Olguin, this is the beginning of a trial of sanity. A dark entity attacks her in her own home. With the help of paranormal investigators, she discovers a gateway inside her house and another one inside her mind. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Tucson, Arizona became part of the United States. Spanish missionaries came looking for souls to convert. Today, their influences are still felt here. Proof that the past is never completely dead and buried. Holguin and her husband Fernando are at a crossroads in their lives. Romy is between jobs and Fernando has recently retired from the military. They have four children and are staying at Romy's mother's house while they search for a new home. One day they decide to explore a new neighborhood. Romy senses that she is being pulled towards something. I noticed this house that had like overgrown weeds that was very run down. I said, I want to look at that house. Fernando, what do you think? He said, no, you're crazy. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Honey, we'll fix that. I don't see why anybody else would want a house the way it was when we first, you know, saw it. Honey, look beyond what you see now. But I want this house. so special about this house? For whatever reason, I was just drawn to it. The couple talks to neighbors, hoping to find out who owns the house. They learn that it is abandoned. No one ever stays there very long. That night, Romy begins making calls to locate the owner. For some reason, she is obsessed with the prospect of buying the abandoned house. Most people, they don't go look for the most rundown house that they can find and say, I'm going to fix this up because that takes a lot of time and a lot of money. I had young children and I wanted to move out of my mother's house as soon as possible. haunted Romy since childhood. I was really scared that I kept having it and that I didn't understand why I kept having it. I thought it was kind of trying to give me a message and if I didn't understand that I was going to keep having it.
Romy eventually tracks down the owner of the house and makes a deal. Honey, we can get the house. I've gone over my bills. You really want this? Yes. My brother's ready to start the construction. Her brother, who was a carpenter. So he said, yeah, it's a doable thing. So that's what made us, you know, decide to go ahead and get it. Okay. After months of renovations, the Holguin family moves into their new home. Romy and Fernando's children are glad to finally have their own space. Hey guys, check your boxes. Make sure everything's inside. Everything's here. Did it's you heavy. open them inside? Everything's there? Yeah, everything's in here. After nightfall, several members of the family are awakened by faint noises. Veronica and Angelica think they hear their brothers talking at the other end of the hall. behind me and she's standing behind me and I'm thinking, oh no. What's in the bathroom? We just ran back to our room and just thought there's something weird about this place. Two nights later. I could sense that someone was there. sleeping. They were sound asleep. I didn't want to tell anyone. Wrong? Because I didn't want them to think I was crazy. I'm just so tired today. Take some coffee. Again. So I kind of kept it to myself. I don't really like it. I always kept thinking maybe there is an explanation for it. Is that good? A few nights later.
I was paralyzed. Romy begins to doubt her own sanity. She assumes that the things she sees are all in her mind. One day, Romy and her sister bring food to an elderly shut-in. There's a black spirit in your house. The moment that he shook my hand, he said, there's a spirit that lives in your house. Please sit down. Please. I don't even know him. I never had seen him or anything. The man says that he is a clairvoyant. He tells Romy not to be scared and suggests that she follow the dark spirit to find out what it wants. Have you followed him? I said, no. I don't care what he wants. I don't want to go there. Be careful. There's a gateway at your house. All the bad spirits might come through it. So please be careful. <laughs> Romy hopes that if she ignores the spirit, it won't come back. Supernatural attacks Romy Holguin in her own bedroom. Fernando, wake up! Fernando, wake up! I was just so scared. I felt as if those dead people were trying to contact me. I had an uncle that would always say, you should never fear the dead. It's the live ones that'll, you know, hurt you. But I, I beg to differ. Fernando tries to be supportive, but he is unsure what to believe. It was kind of hard because there was really nothing I could do other than just listen to her and try to comfort her. I said, that's it. We've got to stay in the living room, so we stayed in there for a long time. Where it was a ritual for the kids. I just felt better if we were all together. I just felt that I could protect them. One night we were settling in in the living room, and my son says to me, Mom, yeah. I know why you want us to sleep in the living room. What are you talking about, baby? Because of the man in black. When he said that to me, I literally started crying and felt really ill. Come on, baby. If I saw it, it was okay, but I just, I didn't want anything to happen to them. So far, the children don't seem frightened. Man in black, I can't take a chance. You're scared. But Romy cannot ignore the likelihood that her house is haunted. I told my wife that if she was that scared, that we should just, you know, sell the house and move. This is our home. I know, but after this, no. But she told me that she would never sell the house. Fernando, we are not moving out of this house. We have to move out of this house. Romy believes that she alone is the target of whatever haunts the place. We are not leaving. You're scared yourself. The family cannot afford to move. So she decides to silently endure her restless nights 
as long as her children remain safe. Romy is very, very strong, strong mind and strong will. And she never showed like she was really scared, but I think that was so that the children wouldn't be scared themselves. I knew there was something here, but I really didn't think there was anything that could harm us. Soon after, Romy feels something tugging on her as she sleeps. She woke up and, you know, told me that she had a really bad dream. Maybe this last night. I, this I said, I mustn't have been feeling so well last night. No, something's not right. I just felt like, like I kept moving. He said, you did. You ended up almost in the middle of the bed, and you were very, very restless. Okay. I was on my way to work, so, you know, I left it at that. teeth marks along the back side of my arm. It scared me so horribly. All I could think of was getting out of there as fast as I could. Romy drives to work unable to comprehend what's happened to her. Joyce, Joyce. For her own sanity, she needs someone to verify that the bite marks are real. Oh my God. You're the person who believes me. Of course I believe you. Look at that. Wow. You see that? Later that night, Romy shows the marks to her husband. Fernando, look at this. The bite mark was really big. Something attacked me in the middle of the night. You could still see him, and that was maybe about eight, nine hours later. That was when he first realized that this is something that's really serious, that it really is real. We got, we got to leave this house. Once again, the family sleeps in the living room. They continue to do this for the next six months. Early one morning. I got that feeling that this man in black was warning me that something was wrong. Something was wrong. I have to go. Romy senses that her elderly aunt, who has been hospitalized for several weeks, is in trouble. I have to go. She immediately leaves to check on her. really early this morning and when she told me that it sent chills up and down my back within an hour she actually died the death of her aunt horrifies Romy she fears this is a sign from the dark spirit that haunts her house but is it a warning or a threat. So what can you tell me exactly about the previous one? One afternoon, when a neighbor comes to visit, Romy learns the details of the house's sordid past. Well, what, what happened? But this house does not have a good history. His father's gonna... A younger teen, maybe age 15, 
had actually shot himself. Oh. The father came home and found him shot and then hung himself. Here? For the first time, Romy has a possible explanation for the things she's seen. I had a lot of trouble at school. Kids pick on me. I was afraid that history might repeat itself. That's what scared me. Romy experiences nothing unusual for several months. I could feel like a swirl of ice cold air just going around me, around me. I could almost see, hear the wind. Romy. 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 having a really bad dream, but I didn't tell her about what had happened because I didn't want to scare her any more than she was already. Finally, Romy and Fernando decide to ask for help. They asked Kenneth Moreland, the deacon from their local congregation, to bless the house. We have a lovely home here. In the blessing of the home, we're actually asking God to be present in that home and to make that home a sacred space. What we'll do is say some prayers together. The couple explains that the house has a troubling history. They fear that something evil is haunting them. The Catholic Church's position on things like this is that we know that evil exists in the world. We don't, as humans, uh, totally understand the realm of that spiritual life, whatever it is that's out there. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right after the deacon left, I felt at peace and I felt like finally, this is it. It was just starting to get dark. I started to feel like something was horribly wrong. I don't know if whatever the deacon did just made them stronger at that moment. Who, who knows? It was so frightening. one story where Jesus was approaching his cemetery and a man came out of the cemetery and he supposedly had a legion of devils in him, meaning many 
many devils. And they beg Jesus to leave and to leave them alone. And I feel that's exactly what was happening in Romy's situation. We had taken goodness into Romy's home and asked for the presence of God to be there. And whatever that presence was that was there didn't like that. Fernando returns home from work late that night and finds that Romy has returned to sleeping in the living room. herself becomes a grandmother. Her frightening encounters have become less frequent. She and Fernando remain in the house. Alec, here's your lunch, baby. She takes care of her grandson, Alec, while his mother, Veronica, is at work. I got the one me to eat this. Alec begins speaking to an imaginary friend in Romy's house. Alec, who's Michael? He calls his friend Michael and claims that Michael sometimes tells him what to do. I kept thinking that maybe he was just making it up. Michael wanted me to go upstairs. As the months went on, he interacted with it so much that I had to come to the conclusion that he was actually interacting with an entity. Veronica, I'm concerned about you. What about? Romy upset. tells her daughter that she believes something might be exerting an unnatural influence on Alec. Mom, don't worry about it. All kids have imaginary friends. Veronica, I really didn't think about him being harmed. I just kind of thought of what in the world are people going to think of our family? First my mom sees things, and then here my son's starting to see them all, so... takes her son home and learns that he is frightened of his new friend. Mama, he didn't want the door closed. He didn't want to be in any room alone. You know, scared of what normal kids are scared of. If something in his closet, something under his bed, or if there was actually something in there that could harm him. There's no one. Because he's my kid, I'd like to just put him in a little glass box and make sure nothing bad ever happens to him. But it's not something that I can control. Alec again visits his grandparents. We're doing that remodeling, and we were upstairs. I was with my uh, grandson, and we were coming back down the stairs. 
all of a sudden, just went tumbling. And then he just turned back and looked at me and said, Tata, why did you push me? And I said, no, I didn't push you. Stairs. You okay? He said, well, we were coming down the stairs. You feel okay? And all of a sudden, Alex's shoulder went forward, like he had been literally pushed from his back. Alec escapes with only minor bruises. But it's clear to Romy the dark spirit is back. Yes, hi, is this Amy Allen? After her grandson is pushed down the stairs by an unseen force, Romy takes action. I couldn't handle myself being attacked, but now my grandkids were involved. Romy contacts a professional paranormal investigator who she heard on a local radio program. Investigator Amy Allen visits Romy's house. Her case uh, was very intriguing. It was kind of a state of emergency uh, because people were getting hurt. The first thing Amy notices are nearby radio and TV towers, which emit high levels of electromagnetic energy. Parapsychologists have suggested that this can cause hallucinations. Amy conducts her investigations with the help of paranormal sensitives. Hey, Amy. How are you doing? I'm good. Sensitives experience the spirit world in various okay, ways. I tell you a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, you won't even really Some experience it visually. Down. I want to see what kind of feeling. Okay. Like it's yeah. Others through emotion. The technician brings equipment to measure energy in the house. All right, Teresa, this is the living room. Let's see how you feel about this room and then maybe head upstairs. I wanted one of three things to happen for them to prove and hope that I was crazy or that they would get rid of whatever was there and thirdly that it wouldn't harm my grandson Amy asks Romy and Fernando not to speak with the sensitives about the case they must approach their investigation without any preconceptions. The readings are really high. We're very scientific, and we want yeah. only the facts, and we have to control this as much as possible. Yeah. The readings are abnormal. The team takes baseline energy readings using an electromagnetic frequency meter. This will provide a point of comparison for detecting energy fluctuations during the investigation. Teresa has the ability to sense the presence of spirits and their emotions. detects an unnatural presence. She couldn't really make any kind of direct contact with him or get a story off of him. Teresa leaves. A second sensitive, Rosalinda, arrives to investigate using a different type of extrasensory perception. Rosalinda's a psychic knower which means that she uh, sees pictures in her mind's eye. Something really, really bad.
she'll actually see like movies playing in, in her mind. What she was seeing was Romy. Because the environment there is so high with the electromagnetic field, it's actually absorbing living energy and then playing it back. So even though Romy and her husband are still alive, they're already being absorbed into their walls of their home and being played back. Rosalinda senses the presence of a dark entity. She tried to leave the room and saw in her mind it saying, go ahead and try to get rid of me. Go ahead, I dare you. Paranormal investigators are convinced that a dangerous entity has invaded Romy's home. The investigators plan to spend the night there to gather more information. While the investigators set up in another part of the house, Romy suffers through a particularly restless night. All of a sudden, I started to get really anxious. I felt like the room was full of people. You have to get out of here. There are too many people here with us. In the house? No, in this room. I got up like really desperate. My husband said, what are you doing? I said, I have to leave. I feel like there's a bunch of people in here with me. I just have to get out of here. Honey, honey, honey. Please. The next morning, sensitives share their experiences with Romy, Fernando, and paranormal investigator Amy Allen. I think Romy has some sort of psychic ability. What we are looking for is a correlation between the different types of sensitives. Yesterday when I was touring the house, I felt a very dark presence in the bedroom, but it was a very strong presence. I had the same experience too, except Teresa and Rosalinda both describe so encounters with a dark figure. So very dark images. Romy confesses that she has been seeing the same thing for years. When Amy hears this, she theorizes that Romy herself is sensitive to the spirit world. She said to me, I don't know how you live here. She explained that there was portals in the house, two of them to be exact, that were like a doorway to the other side. Spirits that you're hearing are coming and entering through those portals. That is something that you will find with people who are sensitive, that they may have some kind of vortex or a doorway for the dead. Basically what happens is they're attracted to the sensitive that resides in that location and this doorway is formed so they can try to make contact with the sensitive that's living there. Are now, I felt like it was all turned around. Not only did I have problems with my grandbaby dealing with this and myself dealing with this and the house being haunted, and now I had one extra thing to deal with. We just need to really go over our data some more. With your own personal strength, can you get rid of all these spirits and ghosts in here, okay? So Rosalinda show shows stage. Romy how to perform a ritual cleansing of the house. And put it in this dish. And you're gonna burn it. And just wait she burns that. sage and, and sprinkles holy water around windows here. and doorways. So Romy could also take on a sense of uh, being proactive in the situation and taking care of what was going on and gaining some control herself. Amy Allen hopes that this will help purify the environment by getting rid of negative energy. But she knows they'll have to do more research to put an end to the haunting. We don't say we have a definite conclusion. We can't do that until we've gone over all of the data. People think that when they have investigators come to the home, 
this person's gonna solve all of my problems right here, right now, today. And unfortunately, that's not how this works. Amy Allen goes home to study her data. She must consider many possibilities before taking action. Is the dark figure the spirit of a deceased human? Or something else? A few weeks after the initial visit, Amy Allen returns to Romy's house to perform her own meditative cleansing. She sets up in Romy's bedroom where the most violent events have taken place. I wanted to see, you know, can I do anything spiritually about this situation? I'm a physical medium, which means that I make contact in a physical sense. When I made contact with this thing, it had no response, no reaction. Amy begins to wonder if the entity is something other than a ghost. I did not feel I had made a connection with an actual deceased individual. It was nothing but energy. experience anything that causes you fear, I want you to repeat the blessings with the holy water and tell the spirit to leave, okay? I'm serious. Even if you have to yell at it and say, I don't want you here anymore, be serious, okay? That should help you out. All right, you'll be fine. All of a sudden, I felt like really like I was going to be sick. I never felt so horrible. I said, that's it. I went back in there finally, and I said, I am not going to let you intimidate me. I'm not going to let you scare me in my house anymore. I need you to go. I need you to leave. Romy calls Amy Allen for help. investigation, a dark entity appears in the home of paranormal investigator Amy Allen. Get out of my house. She recognizes the entity as Romy's tormentor. Hello, Amy, it's Romy. It's back. The man in black. No, Romy, you sent it to me. Amy, what are you saying? What are you talking about? What did she say? You sent that man in black to my house. Amy suddenly realizes something quite extraordinary. The dark entity is not a ghost at all. It's a 
poltergeist. Something Romy has unknowingly manifested herself. It was like a huge puzzle, and I had all these facts, and I'm like, it's Romy. The haunting was coming from Romy herself, and she was projecting it out into our physical reality. Amy concludes that Romy possesses psychokinetic or PK abilities. She's created a physical embodiment of her own anxieties. Anger, depression, anxiety, guilt, remorse. What that means is it's, it's not a ghost living in the outside world. This is the most extreme type of poltergeist haunting. Romy, because she's in charge of the family, couldn't allow herself to really experience these emotions. This entity is inside of you. What she ended up doing, without her even consciously being aware of this, was to project her emotions out. This consciousness took on its own dynamic force. It's almost like I'm beating my own self up, technically. I was frightening my children that I wanted to protect. I was protecting them from me, and at the same time, I was scaring them. I was the one that was tormenting them, and myself also. I call it my curse. Today, Romy and her family live in relative calm. But they still occasionally struggle with both the spirits that haunt their home and the poltergeist that torments Romy. I would like to control this in a way where I could do good and not evil. But it seems kind of hard for me to do that if, in fact, I have the ability to torture even my own self. If she doesn't deal with her abilities and get a handle on, on her energy and all of these things, it could come back as it was before, or even worse. It really is a curse to me. One thing I found in common with all PK manifestations is that the person needs to have counseling, some type of therapy where they can vent their emotions in a safe, positive space with someone who's not going to judge them or be upset with them, where they can literally unleash all of these emotions that they've kept repressed. So therapy is consistently a recommendation in these cases. In this world, there is real evil. In the darkest shadows and in the most ordinary places. These are the true stories of the innocent and the unimaginable. Ron and Nancy Stallings believe they have found the perfect house until a sinister spirit attacks from beyond the grave. Paranormal researchers try to bring peace to the family and to the dead trapped in the land. The Stallings realize if they don't get out soon, they won't get out at all. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are open, nightmares become reality. Ron Stallings and Nancy Simicott are looking for a new home. 
They will be married in less than a week. With her marriage quickly approaching, Nancy attributes her nightmare to nerves. for less than a month when they actually begin looking for a house to buy. We had six children the day we got married. <laughs> some were his, some were mine, both from previous marriages. And we needed a large house that would accommodate everyone. And like most young couples, we didn't have a lot of money. The first time that we saw the house, I thought it was a great bargain. The owner is an old woman whose son is selling the property. The house had been built in the 1920s. It is a spacious, charming fixer-upper, looking nothing like the house from Nancy's nightmare. And remarkably, it is well within their price range. The house has been empty for a year. It needs new paint, wallpaper, repairs. But to Ron and Nancy, it's perfect. They buy the house. thing to say I got bad neighbors or what and I didn't know what he was talking about Within two months, the family moves in. Alan Simicott is one of Nancy Stallings' children from her first marriage. My stepfather had children of his own, and uh, there was kids with my mother. And uh, when they got married, it was almost like the Brady Bunch. seemed like a, a normal house. It was just old. For the newly blended family, moving day offers hope and the promise of new beginnings. Something happened there, like something might happen there again. 
I didn't care for the basement at all. I mean, from the first day, I never liked the basement. I decided I would open some windows. At first, I thought they were painted shut. I couldn't get them open. the window shut with big nails. It soon becomes clear something is not right with this house. Hey, 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 whoa, guys, walking legs in the house, you know better. Yeah. Walking legs in the house, you know better. Faucets would turn off and on. I didn't understand how that could happen. We figured it must be because it's an old house. Within a month, the family settles into a comfortable routine. dishes move. I mean, not just like one or two dishes falling over in the, in the strainer, the whole strainer moved across the counter. And we just kind of looked at each other like, did that really happen? Not wanting to alarm the others, Nancy keeps the incident to herself. But her son cannot get it out of his mind. I was freaked out, and it still freaks me out. Summer turns to fall. The days grow shorter, the nights longer. Alan and his younger brother share a bedroom. I would lay there at night, I would hear a heavy, footsteps, like heavy boots. I could hear them come up the steps. I know it wasn't my parents. And I was terrified. The old lady that lived in that house thought that someone was getting in, moving her stuff, and taking her stuff. And she had her son nail those windows shut. I'm glad to have you. I said to Rob, I wonder why she thought someone was taking her things. The shocking answer will come all too soon. Fall of 1965, Ron and Nancy Stallings are settling into their new home in Baltimore. But their eldest son, Alan, knows that something is strange about the house. Hey, 
As weeks pass without incident, Nancy's concerns drift away. Friends and relatives come to visit, happy for Ron and Nancy's apparent good fortune. Hey, Ron, how you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. My cousin, Bill, who was a lawyer, came to see our new house. Wow, this is beautiful. Isn't it? You want to take a tour? And he wanted to see upstairs. So he got halfway up the stairs. And he got a really strange look on his face. Excuse me. What's wrong? And he said, I don't have time now. Oh, yeah, I forgot about this. Because what do you, you got to be going in such a hurry for? He always says, oh, I got to get to court. I just got to get to court. Bill later explains that he was overwhelmed by a sudden feeling of dread. It will be months before he comes back. One night in October. Nancy has the distinct feeling that someone is watching her. Hey, Ron. Ron, I think I hear something. of the inexplicable events in his house, Ron turns to his uncle. My uncle was a priest, and I knew he knew a lot about that subject. How could I help I told him the story, and I thought, he don't believe me. What am I going to do now? He's not going to help me. We have things that didn't move in the house. Ron can hardly believe the story himself. very I didn't believe he lived after when he died. I believe when you died, that was the end. Whatever we need. And I said, can you come over to my house and bless it, maybe? He said, yeah. I said, well, when? He said, about two weeks. I said, I can't wait two weeks. So he said, all right, I'll come this afternoon. the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We actually had mass in the house, like a regular Catholic service. And I was glad that we were doing something about it. The priest blesses the entire house, room by room. I was hoping that it would take care of the problem. It was like a big question mark. Will this work? Will it not work? And that night, everything was real quiet. 
And I thought, well, gee, maybe it did work. Maybe that was the answer. But then it started with a vengeance. We heard a ruckus out on the porch. It was loud. A tricycle was just riding down the porch. And back by itself. suddenly realizes that the priest had never blessed the porch. Shh. I'm going to take care of the porch. I didn't know what was happening. I grabbed the crucifix, thinking that was the answer. And it stopped. Terrified, the family immediately leaves the house. With nowhere else to go, Ron takes his family to his father's cabin about an hour outside of Baltimore. The cabin has only one room, too small to accommodate such a large family. It's also a considerable distance from the children's school and Ron's workplace. He knows it is impractical to stay there for very long. I thought they could get enough nerve to come back again and hope it stopped. Ron feels like he has no choice. They will have to go back. Stallings are prisoners in their new home. Financially, they are trapped. They have six children and one on the way. We wanted to move, but we had all of our money tied up in that house. And with children, you can't just move. Things would go almost in cycles, where for a week or two, things would happen like every day. And then it might not happen for a couple of months. For several months, the disturbances died down, and Nancy hopes for the best. In 1967, she gives birth to a son, her first child with Ron. Nancy hopes that she can sleep more peacefully in the hospital than she has at home. The atmosphere in the room changed. There. I kept feeling like someone was in the room.
Who's there? Cold. I'll get you a blanket. Nancy now realizes that whatever has been haunting her house can follow her anywhere. The next day, when I was getting home from the hospital, I was a nervous wreck. I was waiting for any minute that something horrible would happen. Hey, kids. How are you? Where's your new sister? Scrapes and bruises. The nighttime just made it worse. There was really no place to go. dreaded if I woke up in the middle of the night and had to use a bathroom or anything like that. First reaction, somebody's breaking into the house. The hair on your arms would stand up. see. I finally got up enough courage just to take like a slightest peek. But then I heard the footsteps go back out. Then I was scared to death. Alan can no longer remain silent. He tells his parents about the footsteps. I just don't know what we can do about this. I felt so hopeless. How do you find something that's not alive? And you can't really grab it, but it can push you. Oh my God, I think I 
it's your pushed. fault. I didn't say it was your fault. I'm, I'm not blaming you. I mean, I just don't know what to do. You woke up the baby. Are you happy now? We yeah, were frustrated. We didn't know what to do or where to turn. Ron and Nancy decide to put their house on the market. You told me that they know a report. Still, they're desperate to find a short-term solution. Maybe we can talk to them and at least find somebody that can help us. I made the mistake of telling a fellow I work with about these strange things that were happening. I mean, he said, hey, I can get you help through the newspaper. So I said, all right. If he wants to see it, that's the only way I get help. They don't do it that way, but I don't want no story in the paper. Now, if you could just tell me a little bit more about this. So sure enough, the man came. Please remember, we don't want our names to be in the paper. Not a problem. I will not put it dressed at all. The reporter no, seems sympathetic. I, the facts. I need some, some hard evidence. What do things it? move? Toys. Toys, specifically toys. He promises to find them an expert. Who's pushed down the stairs, our son. Someone with experience dealing with the paranormal. And you know what? That's everything I need. I can give you that. But Ron and Nancy have placed their hopes in the hands of the wrong man. A local reporter publishes a story about the strange events at Ron and Nancy Stalling's house. They are shocked and angry. So are their neighbors who worry about falling property values. And prospective buyers who suddenly stop calling. The neighbors were pretty bad. They had ridiculed us, and we ended up with a lot of harassment. Nobody believed in ghosts, supposedly, but nobody wanted to buy it either. So we were stuck there. this dream okay. uh, several nights in a row. Okay. It wasn't an ordinary dream. It was like an experience. Ready? About the third time I had the yeah. dream, I began to smell gas in the house. The gas looks and I told Ron, I said, something smells like gas. Are you sure? Yeah, it's pretty strong. He looked and he said, everything looks fine. Sure. To be safe, Nancy calls the gas company. They said they'd be out right away and to open all of the windows.
phone. He checked the pipes and there was one connection that was really loose. Blow it any second. Blow the pipe? No, the whole house. The gas leak was so bad that the house was a bomb. Unwilling to remain a victim, Nancy reads up on the study of ghosts and paranormal phenomena. One book in particular catches her eye. It is written by Hans Holzer, an expert from Austria. In the book, he talked about getting rid of ghosts, and he had an address where he could be contacted. Nancy sends him a letter. Months pass with no word from Holzer. As Nancy struggles to make sense of her dreams. I kept telling myself, maybe it's not a threatening thing. Maybe she was trying to warn us that the gas man who installed the furnace had left this pipe undone. But somehow, I didn't think that she was. It was just a horrible feeling. I'm Hans Holzer. This is my associate. Finally, Hans Holzer arrives, accompanied by a trance medium. You cannot investigate hauntings and ghosts by just going around with Geiger counters and other technical equipment and wait for things to happen. You must use a trans medium, a human trans medium. Nothing happens without it. Everything else is useless. The trans medium has the ability to permit spirits to communicate through her. Holzer has worked with her for several years. I was curious to see if they were going to be able to do anything because the, the blessing didn't work. Holzer feels certain that he and the medium can contact the spirits haunting the Stallings house. Well, perhaps we should begin. But not knowing their true nature, he has no idea if it's possible to force them out. For nearly a year, spirits have haunted the Stallings family. With the help of a trance medium, Dr. Hans Holzer will attempt to contact them, then try to force them out of the house. The medium senses an unnatural presence. She was saying there were several different entities there in the house. And the spirits would actually talk through this woman. It's what we would call dissociation of personality. A deep trance medium has the ability to move out of their body and let somebody else get in temporarily. It is Holzer's job to then communicate with the lost soul. The medium detects a mysterious confluence of energy.
means nothing to Ron and Nancy. She asked him what he was doing there, and he said that he was waiting for supplies to come in on the Constellation in the Baltimore Harbor, and they were there to protect the city. Uh, this is Civil War territory, just at the border, where the, the north and the south met. And there was anger, a lot of anger in that area. Holzer suspects their ghost to be a soldier from the Civil War. He's watching at night, wandering. Somehow he's trapped between life and death. It seems impossible to Ron and Nancy as the house was only built in the 1920s. We were told that it didn't have anything to do with the house itself. You could have a brand new house that was basically tied to the property, not the house. They live in, in the land. And if there is now another house, they don't see that. They see what they remember. Suddenly, the medium detects another presence. She slips into a trance and begins to make contact with a woman. The woman is angry. The medium senses a name. Kittinger. She asked the, this lady, why are you doing this to these people? And she said, well, these are my servants, and they're insolent. They don't listen to, to what I'm telling them to do. But she thought that she still owned the house. The only problem we have with ghosts is they don't know exactly what they are. They die and don't know they're dead, and they don't know what happened to them, and they're confused. There's no question here. Later that evening, Holzer delivers his prognosis. Holzer believes Nancy to be psychic and that her dreams are not nightmares, but psychic communications from the world beyond the grave. The problem was that you had a medium in the house, living in the house, and that's Nancy. And as long as there's a psychic living there, they will get energy from that and stay. We had opposing forces in the house. One was evil, and some were benevolent. Nancy believes that the Civil War soldier, Louis Fontenille, is protecting her family from the malevolent ghost of the old woman. She was close to being insane. As far as she was concerned, we were intruders and she wanted us out of there. From one life to another. Holzer and the medium decide they must contact the spirits and convince them to cross over to the afterlife. I just didn't know. I didn't know what to think. Days later, the house remains quiet. Nancy's cousin Bill becomes intrigued by everything he's hearing about the haunting. Yeah. He admits he'd always felt uncomfortable in the house. He wanted to see if any of these names actually turned up, or if it was all just something that was made up. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll um, go down the hall. Bill decides to research the names and details given by the medium. He goes to the Hall of Records in Annapolis. And the more he tried to prove these things to be untrue, the more they jive with what this lady was saying. 
he finds a listing for a Lieutenant Fontenil, an officer in the Union Army. He was killed in a skirmish at an inn that once stood on the Stallings property. In records dating back even further to 1787, he uncovers another name, Eileen Kittinger. He wonders if this is the old woman from Nancy's nightmares. Bill discovers that another home stood on the same piece of property where the Stallings house is now, built in the 1700s. Sifting through tax records, deeds, and ancient maps, Bill notices a disturbing trend, a shocking revelation that even the medium failed to detect. And for the Stallings family, it could mean the difference between life and death. returns from the Hall of Records with a shocking discovery. Records showed that every family who ever lived on that land had at least one person die before they moved. Each owner, each one. I was really afraid that one of us, a member of our family, that something would happen to them, you know, before we got out. After months of trying to sell the house, Ron and Nancy finally find a buyer. They even express interest in ghosts. What's, uh, what's with the crucifix? The rumors of a haunted house seemed to them a selling point. That's great! I was just so relieved that we were finally getting out of that house that I couldn't wait. I was just praying that nothing happened between then and the time we actually moved out. Because when you leave, I'm leaving, and I won't be there to protect you, and you won't be safe. And that was good enough for me. I couldn't have been happier than I was that day. It was a wonderful feeling to be able to know I was finally free. The Stallings cannot depart fast enough. They leave even before the movers come to pack up their furniture. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that there is some type of life after death. Then some, some type of spirit some kind of presence there. Just before the family departs, Nancy recalls an item she left in the bedroom. What? Where are you going? Just take a second. I'll be right back.
that house, I can't even describe how good I felt. Let's go. We had made it through that terrible experience. And now we would be able to live a normal life. For the Stallings family, the nightmare is finally over. But what terrible fate lies ahead for the new owners? No one, not even Dr. Holzer, can predict with any certainty whether the haunting will ever stop.